speaking to you from my home territory, Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation in Ontario, where I'm a member, but I'm a professor at the University of Saskatchewan and scientific director of Skipper. So over to you, Candice. Great, thank you, uh, Malcolm, and, and uh, hello, everyone. I'm Candice Graphic. I'm a patient partner and co-chair of the Learning Health System Council. And uh, I'm coming to you from Treaty 6 territory, Saskatoon, uh, which is uh, the, the traditional territory of many First Nations and also the homeland of Métis. And I'm uh, really happy to be with you this afternoon. Uh, and I think that there may be some patient partners with us today. And so if there are, hooray, and uh, welcome to you. And um, uh, I, I want to begin by just saying that, you know, I am of the view that um, patient-oriented approach to implementing a, a robust learning health system in Saskatchewan uh, will really, uh, I think, improve care experiences and the health outcomes uh, of people by exploring the complex and interrelated factors that matter most to patients, families, and communities. And a learning health system approach that brings together today the expertise of patient partners and academic and researchers, policymakers, and healthcare providers, uh, I think will have greater impact than when these experts act alone. And so we're very fortunate to have with us today, Dr. Matthew Manier leading our session. Um, I first learned about Matthew's work several years ago uh, when Skipper um, brought forward uh, the 2019 foundational article uh, authored by Dr. Manier and his colleagues, a framework for value creating learning health systems. And, uh, it has been an article that has informed our work and, and uh, I found personally resonated uh, with me through uh, many of, of the concepts in that article. So it's certainly a pleasure to introduce Matthew to you today. Um, Matthew Manier is an assistant professor in the Department of Family Medicine and Emergency Medicine at Laval University and researcher at the VTAM Research Center for Sustainable Health. Now, when I saw VTAM, I thought, hmm, that hearkened me back about 60 or more years to my um, high school uh, required Latin course. And I don't know, Matthew, if that's where that comes from, but um, my recollection is that it means life. So um, anyway, it took me back. Um, so the VTAM Research Center for Sustainable Health. He's also co-director of the Quebec Primary Care Practice-Based Research Network. His research aims to enhance the integration and person-centeredness of mental health and primary care services and strengthen health systems. So welcome, Matthew. Thank you again for joining us and for leading our session today. Thanks very much, What's Candice. So it's actually vitam eternam, it's sort of like a, a everlasting life. It sort of goes with our, the idea of our research center about uh, sustainable health, you know, promoting health and like creating health systems that focus, that generate health rather than being illness management systems. Yeah. So um, so that's great. Uh, are we going to do, Charlene, a, a presentation of the teams now, or do you want me to start my presentation right away? Uh, we'll go to the co-PI introductions. Maybe we'll just go in the order that they are listed on the agenda. So we can um, start out with Barbara Forensler. Hi there, I'm Barb Forensler. I work in the School of Public Health at the University of Saskatchewan. And, um, and yeah, our team is proposing a project around reducing the harms of health data gaps in Saskatchewan uh, related to substance use and mental health concerns. Uh, not sure if you won't need any more detail. Maybe, uh, Barbara, you ju just could say if there are any other team members on the call at the moment, if you know. Um, 
Yeah, I believe uh, actually Dr. Charles Plant will be a, a co-investigator with me and uh, ch there's Chuck waving. Hi Chuck, good to see you. And uh, Marie Agaritas was also going to join today if she was able to do so, uh, but I'm not actually seeing her name in this large chat box at the moment, but I'm sure she'll be eager to watch the recording. So uh, we're glad to be joining today and thanks so much for sharing your expertise. Thanks. Uh, Mamata Pandey. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Mamata Pandey, and I'm a research scientist at the Saskatchewan Health Authority. And I'm working in partnership with uh, Indigenous partners and key stakeholders. And the main aim of our project is to develop a, a supporting learning community which will help us to gather information about all mental health programs which are currently offered through SHA and also through various indigenous communities or other communities in the province. And the aim is to have uh, uh, an exhaustive list to identify programs that are uh, performing really well and to use those lessons to then scale up and uh, improve access to care for Indigenous uh, people in our province. And uh, I think Charles uh, is also here and he's a co-investigator on this project as well. I'm not sure if Talia, my other partner, is on. Okay, well, thank, thank you, Mamata. Uh, can we go to Colleen then? Hi. I'm Colleen Dell in Sociology and School of Public Health, and we have Janet Gunderson with us today, and Jane Stempion, the co-PI with me, is not uh, available today. Uh, we're looking at the role of therapy dogs in the emergency department. We're the ones that want to do another controlled trial, though I don't think after all my meetings that's really making sense anymore, so I'm really looking forward to what you have to share today. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Gary Group, please. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Gary Groot. I'm the only member of our team that is uh, at this meeting today. The others were not able to attend. Uh, and actually, I just stepped in as co-PI uh, just recently. We've had a little bit of a shift in leadership. Uh, we're going to be looking at, we're going to be proposing uh, some look at the mental health uh, of people who are living with uh, post-COVID condition. Um, and we have a team uh, of researchers and, and patients and system leaders who are in interested in trying to support that. Okay, uh, thank you, Gary. Uh, can we go to Dory Godet? And I'm, I, it's sorry if I've mispronounced that. I don't think Dory's actually on the call. I'm Andy McClutchy. I'm the VP of Integrated Northern Health, and I'm one of the the uh, participants in that uh, that study or the sponsor actually, uh, and uh, we're basically hoping to to look at the Indigenous experience in mental health and addictions in PA with the idea of of creating mechanisms for improving uh, how the services meet Indigenous uh, patients and their families. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Andy. Uh, PA for those in Quebec is Prince Albert. Yeah, I got it. Okay. Uh, so, uh, and then finally, uh, Cameron Mang. Hi there. Um, I'm, I'm Dr. Cameron Mang. Um, I'm at the University of Regina. The project that our team is, is developing is focused on um, management of mental health and addictions challenges uh, for people living with long-term disability due to acquired brain injury. Uh, and also on the call uh, today is uh, Dr. Sarah Donkers, who's uh, at the U of S and is another team member. Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, uh, teams. And uh, I guess now we can hand it back to you, uh, Dr. Manier. Okay, perfect. Okay, please uh, feel free to call me Matthew. Uh, it's, uh, I don't, uh, not big on super formalities. So I'm just gonna share my screen. Can everyone see that okay? Okay, great. Okay, so um, so I'll be leading your workshop today, and uh, thank you for the nice uh, introduction, Candice. It was really uh, wonderful. 
Um, so I'm a, I'm a researcher that focuses on uh, health systems and specifically the organization of healthcare and primary care and mental health. And uh, in the past few years, I've been doing a little bit of work on trying to support the, the implementation of learning health systems in, in my province and increasingly in, in other provinces as well. So really happy to have this uh, moment uh, with you today. Um, and I'm also the, one of the external members of the LHS Council involved in, in evaluating the proposal. So we thought it'd be helpful to you to sort of talk about this, this component a little bit more. Um, so what I thought the, the plan for the workshop is to really try to keep this sh as short as possible and to spend as much time discussing with you as we can. Um, I'm going to be presenting to you very just quickly the, the criteria related to learning health stems that's going to be used as part of your evaluation for your, your LHS uh, projects. Um, I'm going to present to you what I, what I feel are the sort of the key components of learning health stems. So I'll, I'll define it and also present to you what I think are um, sort of the main things to be thinking about when you're talking about implementing a learning health stem. And hopefully the most of our discussion today will focus on how we can apply some of those ideas to your own projects. Um, so that's that's the plan. So as you know, so you're here today because you're participating in this call for proposals for patient-oriented research learning health stem projects. Um, if you think about the, sort of the main goals of the call, I mean, what you're really asked to do is to create teams that bring many of the key learning health stem partners together to do a project together. So that means creating some meaningful partnerships between researchers, yes, but also patient partners, clinicians, decision makers, and, and other health STEM partners. So, and that's really what you're going to be looking to do to when you build a learning health STEM is to bring these different partners together. Um, and the projects are going to help initiate some cycles of continuous learning and improvement in order to address some system and community needs that are that are that are existing, but also to do it in a responsive way over time. So I think that's to me what the, the essence is of this of this uh, call for proposals. Um, very quickly, the selection criteria. So as you know, you've all received your application packages um, to sort of uh, help prepare your, your final proposals. And within that, you have the, the selection criteria for the proposal. So there's a, a wide range of criteria. Um, and several of these different criteria uh, are things related to a learning health system. So for instance, having patient partners and community members engaged in your project is something that's totally consistent with a learning health system perspective. But there's also one specific criteria that focuses on the learning health system requirements. And so I just want to present that quickly to you now. Um, and so, and it's worth 8% of your, of your score on your, on your proposal, but there's basically two sub criteria to think about. So one is that the application situates the project within the learning health system. So that means your project is going to be consistent with some of the principles, the ideas, the concepts of a learning health system. And then there's a sub criteria related to patient reported outcome measures, so PROMs, and patient reported experience measures that are integrated within the project. Okay, so um, I think that you should know what PREMs and PROMs are. And today I won't be going to that in any major detail. If, if these are, this is a language that's new to you, then I really encourage you to sort of uh, do your homework on what PROMs and PREMs are and how they might apply. Um, what I'm going to focus on today is probably the first, mainly the first criteria about how to situate your project within the learning health system. Um, so just, you know, like, what does that mean? So what does it mean to situate the project within the learning health system? So I'm going to present to you a bit sort of like the key sort of foundational things related to learning health systems, uh, in, from my perspective anyway. And um, it's pretty consistent with what we see in the literature. And then from there, um, you can, we can, I'm going to help you think about sort of like how to take some of those ideas and apply them to your, your projects. So um, the learning health stem um, sort of concept emerged uh, uh, not that long ago. So we know that the Institute of Medicine in the United States was the one who sort of put forth this, uh, these different definitions and different vision for a new way of doing, a, of organizing our health stem. Um, I'm going to present to you here the learning custom definition that we use in my, in my paper that we that the Candice referenced, the 2019 paper. But um, it's easy to find the, the definition that the IOM uh, presented uh, uh, over 10 years ago. So, but the way we look at it is a learning health system is a, as a dynamic health ecosystem where scientific, social, technological, policy, legal, and ethical dimensions are aligned to enable cycles of continuous learning and improvement to be routinized and embedded. That, that aspect's important. Across the system, thus enhancing value through an optimized balance of impacts on patient to provider experience, 
population health and health system costs. That last little bit, if you're familiar with the quadruple aim, you'll see that in terms of what kind of outcomes you're looking to achieve, okay, that we, we're thinking about trying to achieve the, the quadruple aim. We're talking about enhancing value. How do we enhance value for, for different partners? So there's different elements of that definition. The, what we like about it is that it covers both sort of the processes that you want to see in place within the learning health system. So this continuous learning and improvement, which is really at the core of what we're trying to do. And we're trying to achieve certain things at different outcomes, um, but it takes a certain infrastructure and support to be able to make that happen and to be able to align the different supports in our environment. Okay, so that's that's kind of definition like the you'll see what follows is really in, in, in consistent with that sort of vision for what a learning health system is. So in terms of the key components of the learning health system, the, the kind of the main components that I want to talk about with you today are the learning community. Okay, and even in some of your proposals, you've been using that language. So I think that's a really good start if you're using that language to talk, think about who's a part of your learning community and how do you work together. The different guiding principles, okay, on which uh, a lot of the work will, will, will be resting. The, the various learning health and outcomes and what's your value proposition. Um, the learning cycle itself, and then the basic foundations. Your foundations are your infrastructures, your resources, everything that helps you maintain that system and make things functional over time. All right, so let's let's get into that right away. You'll see this goes pretty quickly and we'll hopefully have some time, a good amount of time to discuss at the end. So when you think about the a learning health system, sometimes people have a very technological vision for what a learning health system is and they really focus on data and data infrastructures and everything like that. And I would say that it's usually better to take a step back and think about like the people, the people that are going to make up this system and how they're going to work together and the different partners that are involved. And, you know, it's, it's great to have a great infrastructure, but learning health systems are socio-technical and it's really important not to forget that social part. Okay. So like learning, like developing that learning community is really a starting point for what you want to try to achieve. And you want to try to bring together all the relevant partners in your learning community, the partners that are necessary to understand and tackle a major system problem that they all face and that the partners that are going to be needed once once you want to engage people in learning and improvement okay so that's the kind of thing you have to think about in terms of these the teams that you're creating do you have all the partners needed to really understand the problem and do you have the people needed to engage in learning and, and improvement okay those are your sort of basic elements so what does the learning community do that they help identify, they clarify the problem, and they're able to document the, the problem. And it's usually a system problem. So we're not really thinking about just one organization, but it's a problem that affects multiple partners in the system. Um, they get together and they reflect critically on these problems. There's dedicated time to thinking about the problems and trying to understand it from different angles, understand the root causes of the problems. Like this, this critical reflection component is usually something that in our systems, we're always running. We don't have time, but if you're gonna engage in quality improvement and learning, it's important to dedicate time to reflection and, and dialogue to discuss, to understand the problems. Um, it's important to establish a shared understanding of how to address the problems, so like what, what are the possible solutions and how are you gonna create value for the different members of your system? Okay, we're gonna come back to the notion of value a little bit later in the presentation. Um, how you make decisions in a learning health system is really important, okay? When you bring together the different partners around the table, you wanna be able to share decisions with them. They, they're your partners and they should be informed of the different options that are available. And it's important to make informed decisions together as a group. So having patient partners be there is important, but having them just in a consulting role where they're not really engaged as, as full partners is not sufficient. And if you have other partners, it's it's really important to think about how you engage them as, as true partners in decision-making so that they're really, everyone has um, accountability for the decisions that are being taken. And finally, it's about taking actions as a group and evaluating the results of those actions and overseeing this learning cycle that you're gonna be putting in place. Okay, what I see in a lot of different systems is that they have different pieces of the learning cycle kind of working, but sometimes they have trouble going around the whole cycle and making it spin multiple times. So that's that's a major challenge. And it's important to have all your partners together with you to be able to make that happen. 
The learning community should engage all the relevant partners, including patients, families, and community members. That, that pretty much goes without saying. They're really fundamental to the process. Um, but you can also include uh, partners from outside the health system. So they don't have to be only people that are focused on health. You want to might want to have people focus on determinants of health and other sectors that are part of your team. Okay, so sometimes if you really want to have an impact more broadly on well-being, then you might want to have other types of partners that are outside of the health system that can be part of it. There's no rule against doing that. Um, your, your teams or your learning health systems when it's in place can vary in scale. It could be very local. It could be provincial. It could be international. There's really no rules around how big or how small a learning health system can be. Um, and it should be, it's a dynamic thing. So the membership of your learning community may evolve over time. It may grow um, or it may change in, in orientation, but it, you want to think about how to make it sustainable over time because the changes you're going to want to do and put in place are things that are often going to be sort of long-term changes and you're going to want to measure the, imp the impacts and sort of keep building on those successes that you've had. So another thing that's important once you bring together this learning community is to have some sort of shared values and principles that are going to guide your work. And there's been some work done in the United States to identify what are the, the shared values or the guiding principles of learning health systems generally. And in the work that we did in 2019, when we put out our, our framework for value creating learning health systems, is we thought about like, how do those values apply within the Canadian context? And are there other kind of values that are important to us? And that's where we changed a little bit of the language of some of the values that were put forth in the United States. We added things like solidarity that you wouldn't necessarily see in the United States or things like equity that weren't really emphasized. Well, for us, equity was really important. And we know how important it is in all our organizations to talk about diversity, inclusiveness, justice. So these are things that you don't necessarily have to adhere to this list, but it's valuable and, and worthwhile to, when you bring together your different partners, say, what are the, the principles that guide us? What are the things that are really valuable to us that we really believe in and are sort of our core values moving forward? I think that like, uh, just as, as a work as a team to make sure you have that shared vision of what's important to you um, is something that's really, it's gonna guide all the work that you do and all the processes that you put in place. When you talk about transparency, when you talk about equity, that influences how you generate your knowledge, it influences how you're gonna apply your knowledge, it influences who you, how you think about in involving certain partners. And so having those kind of principles as a foundation for your work is gonna be pretty important. So moving ahead to outcomes, okay? So it's really, really essential to think about what the learning health system is trying to achieve both from a short-term perspective and a long-term perspective and trying to get a real consensus. You're going to be bringing together partners who sometimes haven't always worked together before. They each come with their own legitimate interests that may be different from each other. And so rec reconciling those and really agreeing on what you're trying to achieve through your work together is essential. And it all comes down to sort of like, what is the value you're trying to create for your members? And uh, in the United States, when you talk about value, there's a whole movement of trying to implement value-based care. If you look at organizations in the United States, insurance companies, and so on, it's often defined as you know, trying to achieve the best outcomes at the best possible cost. And those are the two sort of main sort of factors that are, are, that are like put front and center in terms of determining value. Um, and for us, in a Canadian perspective, we understand that you know, that's, it's also it's very important to achieve outcomes. Um, it's not just about you know putting better managerial processes or improving access to care. We want to improve patient outcomes and community outcomes, uh, influ influence population health. Those are important things, and it's obviously we, containing costs and, and taking into consideration costs are really important. But there's other factors that that we think are important, and so when we think about outcomes, okay, we've often centered our work around the quadruple aim, and so. These are the, the sort of four main types of outcomes that systems should try to achieve. And even in the call for proposals, when you look at the outcomes that you're striving to meet, the, I think the quadruple aim was present in terms of how you should be defining the different outcomes for your projects. So um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's about striking the balance. I mean, when you talk about the quadruple aim, it's about how do you achieve, how do you achieve the optimal balance between these different sort of elements? There's not one measure of value that's going to speak to all people and that's going to be 
the ultimate measure that you're going to be able to use to determine success of your projects. Usually there's going to be multiple measures that you're going to be interested in and trying to find the right balance between those different measures is, is going to be key. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a growing movement towards considering equity as even like the fifth aim of health systems. And so I put it there as something to keep in mind. But um, to give you a sense of sort of like what this kind of looks like from my point of view, um, to go back to the idea that there's not a single measure, like we have access to, uh, available to us a wide variety of different measures of different kinds of, of um, dimensions of quality and other stuff that we can look at. So we can measure the patient experience, we can measure costs, we can measure population health, and we can also measure provider experience. And so the idea is that if you have some sort of state of affairs and you introduce a change, your project comes on, uh, comes around and, and, and introduces an intervention, introduces changes, uh, people are working together in different ways, but ideally you're able to see changes on some of those measures and um, in a way that you, you find satisfactory in terms of finding the right balance. So in the example here, and this is just a totally fictional example, but you've made some sort of change and you've seen that patient experience has improved and population health is going up, but you haven't impacted your costs and you haven't uh, worsened provider experiences. And so you've managed to find a better balance between the different sort of measures you have available to you. And so that's the kind of idea. If you had blown up costs, as well as improving patient experience, well then you've improved things, but you've also had a cost issue that like made things maybe not sustainable. Or if you've really improved your patient experience, but at the detriment of providers who are now totally strained to, to meet these new, uh, these new norms and these new practices, but are you really much further ahead than you were before? So it's all about trying to find a balance between those different measures and those different impacts that you're looking for. Okay, and that's what we talk about creating value is trying to find that optimal balance and maybe a more equitable balance between the different outcomes that are, that are being achieved. Okay, and that's where it comes into the other part of the, um, the other part of that criteria is that introducing these patient reported experience measures, introducing these patient reported outcome measures becomes really important. Okay, because it becomes part of the equation in terms of determining whether you're achieving value through your projects, okay? And that goes to the, the second sub-criteria for this, uh, this application is that PREMS and PROM should be somewhere in there where you're actually capturing data that's meaningful to your patient partners, to your, your family members, your community members, and so on. All right, so that's how it kind of fits within the equation. There. So the learning cycle is when some team, sometimes when people think about learning health systems, they think really about the learning cycle. For me, it's a part of what a learning health system is. It's the processes that are going on, but it's not the only thing that should be important. But obviously achieving this learning cycle is really what you're striving to do, right? And so and the, so this is very consistent with the, the call for proposals and how uh, the skipper understands the, the learning cycle. Um, so you have this sort of practice to data phase where uh, you're thinking about capturing data in either a routine way or through other kinds of data collections through research and others, and you're generating you're generating that data that you need. And then you're moving from data to knowledge to sort of translate the data you have into usable knowledge to support decision making and better understand what the issues are. And then you're applying that knowledge, you're determining what steps to take and how to change practices, and that cycle continues on and on. Okay, and it's the learning community that sort of drives, that oversees this entire process. And what you're sort of striving for is a learning cycle that, that moves quickly, okay? That sort of, you're accelerating the, the normal way of doing things. I think that we generate and we apply, and we generate data, we apply, we turn it to knowledge, and we apply it to practice way too slowly in our health systems. And so we have to find ways to, to go around this cycle much more quickly. It's doing it in a way where we're as much as possible working with routines and routinized data that's captured so that the, the knowledge that's generated is really a byproduct of what's already going on. It's not only driven through research related data collections. Um, it's a continuous process and it becomes part of the culture. It's embedded within the way we do things. It becomes part of the culture of the system. So that's the kind of vision for what the, the learning cycle, how it should work and how the, the learning health system should, should function. 
So just really quickly in terms of the data to practice step. Okay, so here you're sort of thinking about, you know, how do you collect the data that you need? And it's about having sort of infrastructures that collect data, maybe through EMRs and other kinds of uh, like clinical admin administrative data collection systems, other kinds of procedures that researchers and uh, quality improvement people can put in place. Um, and you're going to want to collect data of different types. So again, data that relates to patients' experiences, their outcomes, but also clinicians can can provide data, systems can provide data on organizations and strategies at a system level and so on. Okay, so there's many different types of data that can exist. It's not only quantitative data, it's qualitative data. It's all different forms of data that are going to support learning. Okay, it doesn't really matter what kind of data it is. It's whether it addresses the needs of the learning community. Um, and along with that comes, you know, discussions on how do you make that data accessible? What is the governance sort of system you need to put in place to sort of manage privacy issues and so on, and, and being able to share the data sufficiently with different team members? Um, and also understanding the quality and security of that data. Okay, like uh, sometimes when you have data collection from certain sources, it's not the greatest quality data. Okay, so how do you sort of manage that and what other sources of data are available to help complete the picture? All right, so that's all some of the steps to think about when you're thinking about practice to data. In terms of data to knowledge, okay, we have, we have collected now different forms of data, okay, when it's available to people and it needs to be converted to something that's usable to support decision making. So that means you have people who are there to analyze the data, who can crunch the numbers. You might have people who are really like, it's their role to be a data scientist or data analysis and, and to really to transform that number so it can be visualized in forms of graphs and pictures and, and plots and all sorts of different ways of visualizing the data or synthesize so that you take something very, very big and you make it much more packageable and, and digestible to people. Um, and it's developing knowledge products, so different forms, uh, uh, summaries of the evidence, summaries of the data. Uh, it can be audit and feedback type, uh, type stuff. Um, and you're going to want to have people, members of your learning community, be together to interpret and make sense of all that data and all that information that gets generated. Okay, and it's all around, you know, this dialogue and reflection and sharing knowledge, uh, looking at the data, sharing people's knowledge, their, their perspectives of providers, their perspectives of researchers, their perspectives of patients. It comes together. It's informed, your, your, your reflections are informed by the evidence and you're able to come to some sort of understanding about what are the next steps for, for your projects. And then you have the knowledge to practice phase, okay, which is about identifying those actions or those change ideas. Now you have the knowledge available. You kind of know where you want to go. Okay, what are the solutions? What are the strategies we're going to use? to sort of make changes. It's preparing that change. It's the change management process. It's introducing quality improvement strategies and implementation science strategies. Um, and it's measuring those changes and those effects, okay? And preparing to measure those effects that you're gonna capture either through people's practice or through uh, other means, okay? And so that's, that's completing the cycle, okay? And so the idea is to be able to work your way around the cycle Okay, and to sustain work around the cycle. So once you have made changes, okay, now what are the effects of those changes put in place? You're capturing the new data on the, the new practices that have been put in place and all sorts of new data is available. And how do you keep building on some of those improvements that have been that you've been able to make? Okay, so whether it's then sustaining and scaling up the changes. So in terms of the foundations that are really important, and to think about, okay, so this doesn't happen all, all, on, all on its own. It takes, it takes infrastructure, it takes teams working together, it takes uh, resources and so on. And so the different types of infrastructures that are important to think about are more scientific type infrastructures, social, okay, social processes, social um, platforms and so on. They're all your technological infrastructures. A at a policy level, there might be things to work on at that level. From a legal perspective, there might be things to think about in terms of what are the legal um, factors that help or that hinder the work that you're doing, and then ethical, okay? So I'll, go, I'll give you an example. I'll give you a couple examples of each of these different things. But one of the, one of the main things that we discovered in doing our work, uh, both in the, the review that we did when we published our paper and also since then, is that most people are not even aware of all the different uh, 
um, assets that they have in their environment that actually could help them move forward uh, towards their learning health thing. And usually sometimes they're, they're in discussions with the other members of the learning community. And it's like that first step where you're saying, oh, like I didn't even realize that that service was available. I didn't realize that you guys had those resources. And just that mapping is kind of important. And what you realize is that to be able to advance to where you want to go, the assets are sometimes there. And it's just a question of connecting them to the, in the right way so that you're able to advance things properly. Okay, and if there's really a hole in what you, in terms of resources or infrastructure, then you have something to really work on to be able to advance things. But often, more often than not, the assets are just around you somewhere. And it's just a question of like learning about it and understanding how can you, can you turn things properly to be able to make, uh, to make advancements in the implementation of learning hosting. So really quickly, some examples of some of the, the sort of pillars or the foundations for learning health system. So from a scientific point, it's having access to the scientific expertise of all different sorts. Okay, it's uh, being connected to research centers or teams. It's having the training programs to make sure that people who are coming up are trained with the right skills um, and so on. There's, there's more. Um, from a social perspective, it's building those learning communities. It's being connected with networks or it's putting in place mechanisms for, for discussion and exchange, like a committee or a working group or whatever it is. It's those formal partnerships or even informal partnerships that you're able to create. Um, from a policy perspective, it's the kind of sort of governance structure you're going to give yourselves as a learning health system. It's how you decide on how you're going to be accountable for the outcomes that you're trying to achieve. It's the policies that the learning community will put in place for itself, as well as the policies that are external that might have an impact on your work, and also the funding mechanism. So a lot of your projects will be funded through research, but how would you sustain that over time? Like, how do you have to think about funding your learning community over time, and what kind of funding sources would be there to, to allow you to be sustainable over time? Uh, from a technological standpoint, these are all the infrastructures, the data infrastructures, all your electronic medical record systems that are going to capture data, your IT systems, all the digital technologies that might be relevant or not to your projects, as well as any sort of platforms for communication. I mean, even having discussions through Zoom is something that can be hugely important to being able to just function as a learning health thing. So just thinking about those different like assets that are, that are technological can be important. Um, from a legal standpoint, these are the things that are laws, privacy laws, laws that might be governing organizations within your health system that might be governing a hospital and so on, the rules and regulations that different professionals or teams or, or institutions have to abide by. And then from an ethical standpoint, you might have access to the ethics expertise. Uh, it's having the right ethical review boards to be able to review your stuff. I can tell you from personal experience, having tried to do like projects in, in Quebec where I was reaching out to multiple uh, institutions, the multi-centric sort of ethics review process was a complete nightmare. There's no way that it's consistent with a learning health system where we're trying to get things done quickly. It completely uh, slowed us down in trying to do our research, even though what we were trying to do was completely not the not a risky project at all. But just those infrastructures are important to be able to like do things quickly. You run into all sorts of trouble. Or if you're doing a quality improvement project that's kind of halfway between quality improvement and research. Understand, like you might need to educate your ethical re ethics review board about what that looks like and what kind of implications it could have uh, for, for, me, for you moving forward. So anyways, those kind of discussions are kind of essential to uh, making the learning house, uh, making the learning cycle uh, go around. So those are, I went through pretty quickly, but those are the different uh, components that I would look for as part of a learning health system. Um, on the website for Skipper, there's a nice little video about what a learning health system is, and it's pretty practical and very consistent with what I presented to you today. So if you haven't seen that, I encourage you to check it out. Um, there's more uh, information online about learning health systems that you can consult. Learning Healthcare Project is some of the leaders in the world uh, proposing their own visions for learning health systems, and it's, again, pretty consistent that you can find some valuable resources there. Dr. Charles Friedman is a world expert in learning health systems. He did a very nice interview. I put the link for you there if you're interested in having his perspective. And uh, the 2019 paper that Candace referenced and during the introduction, here's what it looks like. You can find it online, it's open access. So you shouldn't have any more problems. If you're thinking about the different components that I presented to you, um, there's more information about each of those different components in my paper. And I put my email address to say that if ever you want to reach out to me for just you know, a quick talk uh, specific to your projects uh, beyond our, our workshop today, 
then I'm making myself available to you. Just reach out to me and I'd be happy to have a chat with you and we can talk about how you know, you know the, the, the learning custom concept may apply to your work or help you think through things. I won't be joining your team, unfortunately, but uh, I could be available to help you uh, just think through some of the, the issues that you might be facing. So that's it for now. I hope I respected my time, uh, Charlene. Um, we can maybe open it up to questions to know if there's any clarifications. But the next step in our discussion is to talk about your project. So if you have a question about how things apply to your projects, then just wait because we'll be able to, to discuss it directly. And I've gone through your projects, at least for the call, the expressions of interest. Things may have evolved in your, in your projects since then, but um, at least I'm familiar with some of the basics of your projects. So we'll be able to really have some, uh, some specific discussions or relate to each project as, a, as part of the next phase of the workshop. So any sort of questions, I'll, maybe I'll stop the share. But any sort of questions of clarification, or I don't know if this was helpful to you. You can just raise your hand if you have a question or a comment. Yeah, this is just to remind people that these are general questions at this point, and Matthew will get to each of the six projects uh, in, uh, in, in due time. Uh, Cameron. Hi, uh, Matthew. Thanks so much for the presentation. Um, I just had a question about uh, time frame of moving through these types of LHS cycles. And I assume it's different for depending on the work that you're doing, but I'm wondering if you can comment at all in practice, maybe having seen some of these cycles happen, are they happening over the course of months or years or, or some other um, uh, time frame? Yeah. yeah. So so I would say that um, there, there is no standard time frame. Like it's really, as you say, it depends on each project. It also depends on whether the resources are there to really make each, uh, each sort of phase of the cycle happen. Um, so and I would say that when you think about quality improvement projects generally, typically you're looking for like shorter cycles. Uh, like I've been involved in Quebec with some different quality improvement collaboratives where when you're working in primary care, let's say if the cycle is too long, people just get disconnected. They lose, they lose interest. They lose like uh, interest in seeing things through. What's really important is to make really small changes, and then measure that and get the feedback and understand what the next step is, and sort of see that you're actually achieving changes, because um, it's really encouraging when you're tracking your data and you see that something access to care is improved or quality of care is getting better. It just reinforces the, the desire to keep working and keep improving. Um, but at a more systems level, it can certainly take more time and it might take months to years to work your way all the way around one cycle. So I guess that's one of the things you might want to discuss as a team or as a learning community, like what's an acceptable timeline for your, for your work and sort of what's realistic to do. Um, if the necessary supports are there all around the learning cycle, but then you should be able to at least go go through it once. And even if it takes you a little bit longer than you expect, then the goal the next time will be to try to accelerate that over time. So you won't necessarily, the goal is not to be perfect and to be, um, uh, to try to do everything, something that would normally take 10 years to do it in three months. You know, the idea is to like, try to become over time more efficient, a little bit quicker each step of the way. So that gradually you're becoming more rapid, working your way around those different phases of the learning cycle. Is that add helpful? I mean, it's not a very specific answer, but the idea is that no. there's no there's no there's no rule in terms of how fast it should be. That's that's very helpful. I, your final comment there about you know thinking about not trying to do everything under the sun necessarily, but thinking about something that you can do. Um, yeah. um, that helps me to um, contextualize it. So thank you. Okay. Perfect. We have time, I guess, for one more general question, and then we should go on to the uh, specific. So, uh, Mamata. Uh, thank you for this wonderful presentation. My question is uh, uh, in terms of having a program evaluation component present within the uh, project uh, when we're looking at learning health systems cycles. So, um, what I'm trying to understand, like, is it always advisable to have like a pre-post kind of evaluation or like uh, if we are just setting up the infrastructure or just observing the current state to even 
get an understanding of where we are before we can even fathom to think, okay, what we need to do and where we need to go. That might, in my opinion, I'm thinking like might end up with some descriptive kind of like, you know, data analysis and uh, kind of results. So is that acceptable within the learning health system cycle approach? Yeah. So, so keep in mind, the goal is to learn as a system. It's not a necessary, you're not doing research necessarily. I mean, like the learning health system can exist without, you know, research outputs, but it might not necessarily exist as well without researchers supporting the process. But, you know, you might be able to, um, I think you need to be able to capture data. If you're making a change to something, you need to be able to capture data that tells you whether your change was making a difference or not. Okay, so, and that can take form, different types of forms. That might be a randomized controlled trial, or that might be looking at clinical administrative data that you've collected routinely that you just have access to that someone can crunch the numbers for you and just feed back to you. So really there's a whole spectrum of different evaluation types approaches that are possible. Um, if you have access to scientific expertise to do more rigorous evaluations, that's great, except that there might also be a trade-off in terms of how quickly the information gets back to you and how the learning cycle goes around, you know? So those are the kind of discussions that you need to have as a team in terms of what's, uh, when do you need the data by and what kind of evaluation are you willing to do? Obviously, the more rigorous uh, evaluation you have, the more confidence you can have in the results, the more exhaustive your evaluation might be, but it's not necessary, no. I mean, managers often work on timelines that are very different than researchers. And if there are decisions to be made because you need to meet with certain partners and have some sort of decision made or you have a, an opportunity to make a change and that opportunity, the window is a short window, then use what you have. Use what you have, the data that you have with the evaluation you have and, and make a decision. The goal is to be in action, okay? It's not to always be in reflection. It's not always to have always the best data, but have the best data available to support decision making. And, you know, the best data available might be just a very descriptive summary of what's happening in terms of services, you know, and then you can build over time more rigorous evaluations if, if needed. Okay, but it's not a it's not an essential or it's not a mandatory thing to have very rigorous evaluations in place. Thank you. Yes, uh, thanks uh, everyone. So I think in view of the time, we should go to the projects 